And if I'm here today again, I'm looking at food and water. Uh, not only do they come together on the dinner table, but they actually are very inseparable as far as uh, things go on in the field in creating food. And that's where I was thinking that uh, when I'm asked to look at the food as a continuity, um, as a cultural, as a social dimension, what are we really looking at? And just uh, walk back into your past and think that uh, the type of food that we used to eat, and what is it that is coming up now, um, uh, it's very different. And let me just give one example to show how things are uh, going different. Um, I was in Bihar for about five, five years ago um, when the Kosi floods were happening. And this was the time when we were looking at the ecological damage and obviously that had links with uh, the cultural uh, trauma that was going on. And I was told that uh, it's not without reason that Bihar has food like Sartu and Chira. So today we might have a fast food of a very different variety, but Bihar had this fast food that did not need to be cooked. So it's baked gram which was ground and kept aside. You could have it in different ways. You could knead it into a dough and have it with chili and onion. You could also put it in water and mix it with some sugar and drink it. So it's a very healthy, wholesome food. And chira is actually uh, the rice flakes, which again, you can use it in a variety of ways. Just dip it in water and have it. So uh, it actually means that uh, people were adapted to live under flood conditions. So four months of the year, you could actually create a system where your food is insured. So you have systems of insuring it. And today when floods come, it comes with devastating ferocity. And it not only destroys your farmlands and throws in sand where earlier it used to be silt, but it also destroys your way of life. And uh, that to me was alarming. And how we have really moved on from our traditional food systems into what is the modern food systems that is coming up now which we really do not understand properly, and therefore I thought, let's understand from the big chef. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so this was my small appetizer, maybe, and we would really look forward to an understanding from Mandanaji. And how we will conduct it is, uh, we'll have some 45 minutes of talk, and from 8 o'clock, we'll open up the floor for discussions. We'll encourage a lot of questions, and she would encourage a lot of uh, inquisition and uh, comments, which we would like to try and uh, see how we can take this thinking forward. Thank you very much, Somnath, and thank you to Leela for such a creative uh, uh, lecture series that you've organized. Uh, I feel very happy so many of the speakers are friends. So that means we keep good company. Um, and the mysterious institution where, I think I was there 10 years before, the 70s. No, 20 years. <laughs> were they 94, right? My PhD guy, Dr. Saman Biswas, the late Dr. Saman Biswas, but eminent particle physicist. I joined him in Delhi University. He was taken to Shantini Ketan to start physics. Then he was brought to JNU to start environmental science. And I used to pack my bags and baggage and go through the hassles of transferring my science talent scholarship. Um, and uh, eventually landed for six months in JNU. And by the time we'd settled down, he said, no, 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 I'm going back to Delhi University. So that's how I ended up in Canada, but that changed four universities in one year. I have to say the food was so bad in Shantinikit <laughs> that I bought myself a heater and one pan. I should boil rice and put an egg into it. Uh, or go down to a little dhaba, which made wonderful food. The name was Kobi Tirtho. 
and uh, every night he would make me deem sabji. Um, of course, food is unescapable. If you have to live, food is life. And it's not an accident, you know, we have a series on the food, biodiversity and food heritage of India. And when we were researching for the rice uh, book, <coughs> India used to have 200,000 varieties of rice. But the ancient name for rice is prana. It's life. It's life. Because India is the center of diversity where rice evolved. You know, the level of the Russian scientist identified these areas with the highest diversity and said these are the places where these crops got domesticated. And we are the center of the diversity of Bengan, and I love Bengan Bhaja, I have to say. Brilliant. Um, rice, mango, banana, um, and you can go on. We are, we are one of the very big centers of a lot of diversity. So food is continuity is, is both the continuity in terms of the places where we are, the crops that can grow there, and the various continuities that make life for us. I've just come down from the back this morning, and interestingly, they do make a kind of sattva. They make it with chana and barley, because they also have just three months of cultivation and then the rest of the time is freezing minus 40 degrees. And that's a very good way to preserve. Uh, they also have amazing apricot. I was helping farmers work out what products they could develop because the trees are just loaded in these remote villages. And uh, they're just falling on the ground. And one of the discontinuities that has been introduced in agriculture is to stop thinking of future generations in agriculture. In fact, the entire economic model, the entire development model, the entire idea of what it means to be developed is move out of the countryside into the city. Whether you find place in the city or not is a secondary issue. So it's really uh, economics of displacement. The first continuity of food is, of course, the ecological imperative that food is, at the end of the day, uh, embodiment of all that goes into the making of the food. It is the water, and not just the water that's used today, but the water that evaporated and then came down as rain and recycled, and we don't know how far back it goes. It is the soil and its fertility, and soil fertility does not come from chemical fertilizers. Soil fertility comes from soil organisms which make the nutrients if we give them food. And that is why food is the web of life. Because the first feeding we have to do is of the soil. The sunshine without sun, you wouldn't have photosynthesis. and the biodiversity itself, the seed. It is the network of social relations that go into food production, including all the ancestors and including all the generations to come. And I did my PhD um, on the foundations of quantum theory. And the real reason I love the quantum worldview is because it breaks away from the worldview that creates discontinuities. Because the mechanistic worldview thinks of everything as a machine and thinks of everything as fragmented, separated, and also seeks absolute certainty in a world of flux where you can't have certainty. You have to have uncertainty and preparation for it. A very important part of continuity is the fact that what we eat makes us. Literally, our blood, our cells, our bones, our brain, food shapes it. We are food. We are what we eat. And then, of course, there is the cultural continuity, because food, at a very deep level, is culture. Which is why 
the rice eating people eat rice, and the Rajasthani is joy and bajra. And I remember when Rajiv Gandhi was traveling to make sure the government programs were going right, because you remember the statement of one rupee of uh, goes down to the grassroots of every hundred rupees spent by the government. And he was in Rajasthan and he wanted to make sure the Russian shops had Russian. And so he asked this woman, Russian hai? She said, bilkul nahi. So he shouted at his bureaucrats, he said, Russian kyo nahi hai? He said, nahi ji, Russian hai, chakai or gehu hai? So he challenged the woman, why are you lying? She said, I'm not lying, rice is not our food. We want jawar and bajara. And you can give a vegetarian all the meat of the world and it won't be food. And you can give the vegans all the dairy products and it won't be food for them. Now, I don't think any civilization of the world has had as much diversity in food as we have. I also advise a lot of Italian governments, Tuscany in particular, and they've managed to put on the UNESCO heritage sign the Italian cuisine. But you know, when I look at their vegetables, there's a zucchini, there's a pepper, bengan, tomato, and that's the end. And you can't even begin to count all the vegetables of India. I mean, we can turn anything into a vegetable. In Bengal, they turn the flower of the, of the banana, the uh, stalk of the banana, the banana itself. Um, and for everything, there's multi-purpose use. The, when I was working with the villagers yesterday on the apricot issue, telling them what to dry, you know, dry fruit is so important. The challenge is how to not make it black. So we were working them on the shade. The kernel, inside is a badam, which they eat as a badam, but they also take out the most finest oil. And when I had a function, they lit a lamp with a big bottle, not of apricot oil, which is the traditional oil, but with soya oil. So of course I picked up the bottle, read every line made by Bungay. Bungay is one of the five big great leaders of the world. And every line is a lie. The word refined, I mean, refined means it should be cultivated to a high level. You blast food at 400 degrees centigrade, add hexane, probably use genetically engineered soya to make it. That's not food. So the first really abrupt disruption in our food system. And you know, other cultures changed too after how did America become junk food nation. Uh, it changed. But it changed over 50 years and 100 years. Till 20 years ago, our food was in continuity. And continuity doesn't mean stagnation. Continuity means change which maintains the system. The system is changing constantly. We are 50 trillion cells in our body. They're dying all the time and new ones are coming up. But this body maintains its continuity. This abrupt disruption, these discontinuities, have very, very far reaching consequences. The first is ecological. Over the last few years, I've been trying to assess the impact of the industrial agriculture system on planetary health. And the figures are shocking. So now your interest is a food water connection. In India, 90% water is wasted. Pure water is wasted to dissolve chemicals and throw out water as polluted water. 90% or irrigation. Did we always do this? No. Till I was a child and I traveled in India, every part of India, even the desert of Rajasthan, Haryana, Punjab, UP, we used to have the Persian wheel. And for those who don't know what the Persian wheel is, it's basically a set of buckets that rotates. And the water has to be high enough for that bucket to pick it up. 
which means at around 10 feet. I have seen 10 feet water across this country. And then came the Green Revolution, which required 10 times more water to dissolve the chemicals. And now Punjab, which is the land of five rivers, some estimates say 15 years, some estimates say 20 years, but we have water, which is why they're talking of the Green Revolution being moved to the east. 75% globally of water is abused and misused for chemical agriculture. I don't know how many of you followed the news of Lake Erie last week, where the lake became absolutely green with algae and became toxic, and the towns around were told, don't touch the water. And it is all because of chemical runoff. 75% of the soils of the planet are degraded, which is why there's a UN treaty on land degradation. And in 1995, when the Convention on Bio when the Plant Energy Resources Conference took place in Leipzig, the assessment was made by governments of the world, how much diversity have you lost because of industrial agriculture? An assessment then in 95 was 75%. My assessment is about 95% diversity in agriculture. So, because industrial farming based on chemicals must be based on monocultures. It's based on uniformity. So 75% of the ecological problem is coming from a system of food production which is not just destroying the natural foundation, the ecological foundation, but it is transforming food itself into what I call non-food. This pesticide-loaded food is hardly edible. I remember I had to, you know, Barcelona had this big uh, cultural festival, and there were Vedic singers from Banaras. And I'd been asked to supply the grains, the diversity of grains, for a particular meal. So I carried a suitcase full of ragi and jambora. And, uh, and the second day they came to me, he says, do you have some of that left? I said, yeah, why do you want it? They said, because the food here, Hindi me boli, yaha ka khana abhaksh hai. Bhog karne yog nahi. Bhog means to consume. It is unworthy of eating, because they were so used to fresh food. They could taste every chemical. The food for them to stank <laughs> has been made into non-food. And this has consequences for the continuity in terms of our body and our health. Cancer epidemic is just overtaking. And sadly, we just don't keep our data in a systematic way. Because I wanted to do accounting of what are the health costs chemical agriculture. There's no centralized place where the analysis is being made. But we have brought out a book called Poisons in Our Food where we synthesized all the research done as. And some of it is not research, some of it is life experience. The 3,000 people who died in Bhopal, the 30,000 who died since then because of pesticide leak, is part of this discontinuity. So many of you are from Kerala, the end of Salvan tragedy, that's a discontinuity. The cancer train that leaves Punjab for Bikaneer, that's a discontinuity. Kidney failures, the news is coming every day how rapidly kidney failures are increasing. Sri Lanka, little Sri Lanka actually did a study. 200,000 people affected, 40,000 dead, and they tracked it to a chemical used as a weed killer called glyphosate or Roundup. Diabetes, of course, we become a capital of diabetes. We are a capital of hunger on the one hand. Because when a system is turned into a non-food system, it doesn't produce nourishment anymore. And it's not just that it doesn't produce nourishment in terms of what's in the food, it doesn't produce nourishment in terms of the relationships. And I'll give you a simple example. So there are a billion people hungry in the world, half of them are farmers and producers of food. In India, 250 million 
is the number of hungry and half of them are farmers. Why do they go hungry? Because they've grown food at such high cost that they borrowed. And when they have a harvest, whoever is the creditor, usually private money lenders, is waiting at their door to take the harvest. So they'll be paid two rupees for their rice. And then when they buy it, bit by bit every day to stay alive, they'll buy it at 10 rupees, 12 rupees. So every year, Indians are eating less. We crossed the Great Bengal famine figure a few years ago. It came, jumped, dropped down from 170 kilogram per capita per year to about 149, and it has to be lower after that. And it's not an accident that every four million is hungry, and every second child is wasted and stunted. Now, a wasted and stunted child will never ever grow up to be fully adequate as a human being, physically and mentally. So in effect, a food system, which has been driven literally by the chemical industry so far, which has now mutated itself into the genetically engineered industry, the GMO industry, um, <coughs> that system does not provide nourishment. The, the food doesn't reach people. So even in the heart of America, you've got food deserts. Where the less privileged people don't get access to food. They get food stamps. Yeah, they get a bit of money. Get a food stamp to go back. But the only shop there is a liquor shop with some packages of Lay's chips and cans of Pepsi and Coke. Again, that's not food. There's new research coming out on autism in the US. Autism jumped 35% in the last two years. And the Center for Disease Control admitted that this cannot be because of genetic issues. This kind of leap has to be because of environmental issues. But then they go to go further to say, what's happening to the environment. But scientists are linking this huge jump to the combination of Roundup and four Roundup ready crops, the GM crops. The graph, 99.9% .9 correlation between the growth of autism and the use of Roundup and GMs. I'm also getting a lot of scientists, psychiatrists. I had a a uh, visit by public health experts in Australia, and they find that half of the children, half of the <coughs> teenagers in Australia are depressed. And they did a brain analysis, and the, you know, biochemistry analysis. All of them have lack of zinc. And these micronutrients were not even part of the thinking of agriculture, because at agriculture came Let's put it this way. The discontinuities on food as life have been introduced through the continuities of chemicals for death. Chemicals that were evolved for the concentration camps and later for the wars became agrochemicals. Even the nitrogen fertilizers come from factories that used to make explosives during which is why so often you will hear of a fertilizer bomb. Oklahoma, Oslo, Afghanistan every day, the high court bombings here. Um, because chemicals were never needed in agriculture. There's no place for chemicals in the reproduction of life. Their introduction came after the war when all those factories that had more made chemicals for killing now had to find a new use for it. So they became the agrochemical industry and totally changed our thinking about how food is grown and have such an amazing spin industry with them. They could, they could convince government after government that you can't grow food without chemicals. I started to look at chemical farming and the Green Revolution in 84 because of the Bhopal disaster and the Punjab problem, Operation Blue Star, Indira Gandhi assassination. The Green Revolution in Punjab got a Nobel Peace Prize. But here there's violence, so something's not connecting. And the one thing I can't live with is 
unexplained phenomena. I, mean, I guess that's the scientist in me. You know? I've got to make sense of things around me. And so I did a study for the United Nations on Punjab and the Green Revolution and wrote a book called The Violence of the Green Revolution, which is when I realized where these chemicals came from. I also realized Lal Bahadur Shah had said no. When we had a drought in 65 and the U.S. said you've got to take the chemical. We needed a little more wheat. And the U.S. said we'll send you wheat if you, take, uh, if you change your agriculture with this Green Revolution Act. He said no, we're a farming culture, we do an experiment. And if it works for us, we take it. And then, of course, he passed away. Uh, Tashkin, I think? Tashkin. And, um, and the pressure continued, and eventually, Punjab was ruined. Hmm? Huh. And in 1962, we said, we said, grow food in your lawns, and all lawns were growing food. There was no grass. And nobody thought it was below their dignity to grow food. Of course, the most serious discontinuity is what made me start Natania in 1987. And that's the discontinuity in seed. The very nature of seed is to continue. That's what bija means. Bija means that from which life arises forever and ever on its own. Ja is life. It doesn't need external support. It's in it. In fact, again in Ladakh, they were saying, you know, these mountains, they look so bare. One little bit of rain we have. They have just 100 <coughs> millimeters. So one rain, and this whole landscape will turn into colored clouds. Just five years, six years, these seeds lie dormant, and then they burst out. So, holding life as potential is the very nature of seed. And holding life with natural evolution terms, millennia, thousands of years of human work with nature to evolve those 200,000 varieties of rice, 1,500 varieties of wheat. And the reason I, start, I started Navdania was I was invited, because of my book on the Green Revolution, I was invited to a meeting on the new biotechnologies. And the old chemical industry was now saying, we've got to own the seed. You know, we're not making enough money. And the only way, they admitted, the only way we can own the seed and collect revenues out of it is through genetic engineering, because now we can claim we've made something new by adding a gene. So I've always said, moving one gene into an organism is not the making of that organism. The organism makes itself. I'm very proud that because of our movements, the Indian Patent Office actually has, our patent law has Article 3J, which says biological processes are not inventions. They're not manufactured, they're not machines, because life is not a machine. In a machine, you can pretend you change one thing and you make something new. But putting the toxic gene in now, I go further. I say, it's not just that you don't make life. In fact, what you've added is two kinds of toxic genes. In Bt crops, like the Bt cotton, you've added a Bt toxin. In Roundup ready crops, you've added another toxin that can resist the Roundup. Adding toxins into food should be punishable offense. And that's not all. Because such a clumsy technology, they have to add antibiotic resistance markers, and we already know the problem with antibiotic resistance. They have to add viral promoters because, again, life organizes itself. It's constantly adapting, and life has a way of silencing something that doesn't belong to it. So when we have organ transplants, you're going to be pumped with huge amounts of chemicals. In the case of genetically modified organisms, they've got to add viral promoters. And Chinese scientists said to me that, for, according to them, the SARS epidemic was a result of super viruses <laughs> being created in the gut of animals who were eating Roundup Ready soya. And the virus, and there's lots of scientific evidence that genes jump. 
this horizontal gene transfer. That these viruses had hybridized in the gut of the animals, and then it had jumped species. H1N1, a famous virus, it had genes from three species. Pigs, chicken, and humans. And it can only happen because that kind of uh, interspecies transfers is happening at the level of labs. So the industry said, we've got to own the seed, we've got to do genetic engineering, we've got to have a global treaty that imposes intellectual property on seed. And that's the day I said, we've got to protect the seed and its continuity and its freedom. Because not only does seed evolve in continuity, it multiplies and therefore cannot run out. There's always enough to share. There's some varieties I've collected three grains of wheat, no more wheat from Madhya Pradesh. <coughs> and about five years later, when the Punjab farmers wanted it, we could send tons. We saved salt tolerant rices in Orissa, and the cyclones keep coming. The farmers are able to grow those salt tolerant rices. <coughs> and I just got a call from our coordinator in Orissa that with the new floods, the Green Revolution varieties get knocked out. They totally got out. But there's such resilience in the native varieties, both to floods, to salt, to bounce back. It's a bit like resilience in cultures that have been able to maintain continuity because continuity comes through adaptation. And adaptation is the secret of resilience. The two ways the seeds discontinuity is achieved. One is through intellectual property rights, which says this is my patent, I've invented the seed, and a farmer saving seed is now engaging in intellectual property theft. And the whole issue was evolved around stopping farmers from having seed. Monsanto even went further in 95 when WTO came into force and said, we've achieved something unprecedented. We defined the problem and we offered a solution. And the problem they defined was farmers save seeds, which for me is a duty. And that's why we started Navdanya, based both on the commitment to save seeds with a pledge that we've received this diversity from nature and our ancestors, we owe it to future generations to maintain the continuity, and we will not obey any law or adopt any <coughs> technology that disrupts this obligation to the earth and to the future generations to come. I won't go into detail about how many attempts are being made to criminalize seed saving, uh, besides the issue of patenting. And Monsanto in that, uh, the representative is called James Enyart, and he said, we were the patient, diagnostician, and physician all in one. We wrote these laws. We wrote the laws, took it to the US government, which imposed it to the world through the WTO. Now, of course, in India's been very strong recently on the food security issue, but they need to revisit the fact that in 1999, the clauses that allow patenting of life, and therefore the disruption in the continuity of seed, were to have been reviewed, and I helped our government write those inputs. That review has never been allowed to be tabled. It's never been heard, 99 till today, which shows how multilateral these multilateral institutions really are. So what we've done in the last, uh, since 1987, is basically meant these broken continuities, which in effect are broken cycles. And the urgency has grown up when I heard about patenting, I, I could imagine certain problems for farmers. But I could not imagine what we've witnessed in this country with the establishment of seed monopolies and the rupture. 80% seed in India before 95 used to be in the farmer's own hand. It was what's called open pollinated, could be saved from the harvest. You select the best. You talk to any group of farmers, ah, which plant hasn't been uh, affected by a disease or a pest. Farmers have been breeders, always, which is why we <coughs> had so much seed, 80%. In cotton today, 95% of the seed is owned and controlled by Monsanto, through three mechanisms. 
convince the farmer that their seed is primitive. They actually have the language of primitive seed. Somehow, our public institutions go to sleep with big corporations arriving on the scene. And the Indian companies which have been producing cotton seed get locked into licensing arrangements and these contracts say they can't sell anything but Monsanto's BT cotton. Even though they've been producing seed for so long. Now if you go to the villages, you'll see packages with different names and you won't realize it's all controlled by Monsanto. All that will tell you that is a little logo on the package which says Bolgard, which is the trade name for the BT cotton. The price of cotton seed jumped 8,000% when GMO cotton was introduced. And it doesn't work as a technology because of this whole issue of not understanding continuity. Yeah. You keep putting pressure now from a BT toxin in every cell of the plant all the time, in the leaves, in the roots, in the pollen, in the bowl. And the insects will obviously evolve because that's what the continuity is about. And so you get a super bowl worm. In the US you get super weeds, which can't be controlled. Now they're talking about spraying Agent Orange, making Agent Orange resistant GMO crops. 17 million acres in the U.S. has been lost to super weeds that can't be controlled by Roundup. We've seen the epidemic of farmer suicide, but I have to date, till date, not seen an official <coughs> addressing of it. Manmohan Singh Ji did give a low waiver, and for a while the suicide dropped in Bihar. 300,000 is what the figure is between 95 to now. Our parliament uh, had a standing committee on agriculture and they studied the issue of GMOs and came to the conclusion there's no place for this. There's a case going on in the Supreme Court. I'd sued Monsanto because they entered illegally in 98. Um, and, and that's what made all the structures of, of the government sort of become alive on regulating GMOs, including the GAC, which had not been approached at all by a consenter. The current Supreme Court case, the court said we don't understand these complicated technological matters, and they appointed a technical expert committee headed by the top scientists of the top institutions of this country, which have any relevance to the issue of biosafety. That includes the Molecular Biology Institute, the National Institute of Nutrition, the Center for Toxicology, and the Technical Expert Committee made four recommendations, both in its interim report and in its final report. First, that so far the companies have been doing the tests and they create absolutely fake reports. The content is one thing and the conclusions are something else. And I saw it in our case from 98 to 2002. They said, no new pests, aphids and jacids, the results were showing 300% more. No, no new pests. No organ impact, the uh, results in the case of BT Bengal were showing organ impact. So they said, it will take 10 years while we set up an interdisciplinary system that is independent of industry and robust. And that's why a 10 year moratorium. On BT crops, I said, you'll need 10 years for science as well as regulation. For herbicide resistant crops, where you make the crop resistant to the spraying of herbicide, which means it kills everything else, and our farms have sometimes 250 species growing in a little farm. That means you get rid of most of the food. We look at the Kerala home gardens, or our terrace fields up in the Himalaya. The diversity is so rich that herbicide resistant crops is a recipe for hunger and food insecurity. And then they said something that any good scientist should accept that in crops of which we are a center of diversity, we should not do genetic engineering because it will contaminate these crops. And that's why we have a convention on biological diversity. 
That's why we have an Article 19.3 in it. That's why we have a protocol on biosafety. It's all about these issues. So the way we are trying to mend these broken continuities is first, of course, beginning with the seed. Saving it, sharing it, through creating community seed banks, because the other discontinuity is seed has always been a commons. And it's only after the intellectual property rights agreement of the World Trade Organization, it was turned into intellectual property, private property, and a commodity. So we reclaim seed as a commons. And it's amazing because the salt tolerant seeds we had saved in Orissa, when the tsunami hit, I'd gone down for rehabilitation. And the government said we won't be able to do agriculture in these areas for five years. So we are giving the farmers a crop holiday. Now it sounds wonderful, crop holiday, but it means starvation for the poor farmer. So I said, no, we'll bring you salt tolerant seeds. And the farmers can grow food in this season. And of course, it was a lot of bureaucratic hassle to move those seeds across from Orissa through Andhra to Tamil Nadu. But the crops bounced back. It was not only were the seeds salt tolerant, they were also flood tolerant. And you might remember that winter, there was so much flooding after the tsunami. And once you have one seed which can be shed, the family of crops which we call forgotten foods which is also another example of discontinuity of culture and memory. Ragi, which is mandua, is one of the most nutritious crops. All the millets are more, they, they can produce for the same amount of water, and we did this calculation. We can produce 400 more times more nutrition using the same amount of water. If we shift from intensely chemically fertilized rice and irrigated rice to the millets. Why are the millets called millets? They're seven species. They're called millets because each seed gives rise to a million seeds. The word millet comes from a million. Can you imagine the abundance? <coughs> so seed has open pollinated for those of you who are more familiar with open source software, just think of the difference between Microsoft patented software and open source. Same with seed. Monsanto patent seed and we spread open source seeds. They are open source biologically because they are open pollinated and they are open source legally that they can be shared freely. And the entire dedication of Nathania is to continue to spread the idea of open source and seed and the reality of open source and seed. And now we've built a global movement on seed freedom. If you go to the seedfreedom.in website, you'll be able to find out more. Um, and it's making a difference. We stopped the laws that would have made local seeds illegal in Europe, in Colombia, Indonesia. I just heard that in the United States, they're sending notices from the Department of Agriculture that you can't have your local seed conservation. So that'll be another big fight. Um, interestingly, the, the discontinuities, and let me just say this on the GMO question. In the US, they never had testing. So when they say proven safe, it's part of don't look, don't see. Don't find and say safe. Twenty years later, a lot of illnesses have started to affect children particularly. And first, a mother mobilized the labeling campaign in California, and now their mothers across America mobilizing all the time, demanding. Simple thing like labeling, which is a law in 64 countries, including ours, and that to be, you know, I had to do a case in the Supreme Court to move this. You know, all the time, even to implement law, you have to go to the courts and say, this should be done. Like the Supreme Court has just now ordered the government to, in two weeks say, what are you doing about the Ganga? Say, they're doing a lot about the Ganga. Supreme Court is to say, tell us what you're doing about the Ganga, because 
everything is so uh, open-ended in the wrong kind of way. Vermont is the first state that managed to get a labeling law. Monsanto is suing Vermont. Because in the US, there's an attempt to create a new discontinuity, which is give corporations personhood. And so Monsanto is saying, we are a person. And by your demanding that we put a label, you're robbing us of our free speech. So people's right to know what they're eating is being defined as the robbing of the free speech rights of corporations as persons. And I think these will be test cases of a very important kind. Not just for the US, because all the new treaties internationally, TPP, TTIP, all are focused on GMOs. That's all they're focused on. And they're all focused on what's called investor state rights, where investors or corporations can sue governments if governments do what they're supposed to do in a democracy. So for example, we have the Food Security Bill. In WTO, US already suing us. But if investor rights become recognized, then it can be struck down. And it's not in courts. These are tribunals, very secretive decision-making, where the logic you know, of the judges and the logic of those who argue, the logic is all about profits and trade come first. People and life don't matter. One of the most important things we've done is to repair the broken cycle of our relationship with the farmers. Because everywhere, <coughs> farmers aren't able to survive. Yesterday, I was listening to TV and heard about a sugarcane farmer. Sugarcane farmers are supposed to be very prosperous, as cotton farmers were supposed to be prosperous. But high suicides are in the cotton belt. And now a sugarcane farmer has committed suicide because I know 60,000 crores owed to the farmers by the sugar factories hasn't been paid. And they're being given credit cards. So this poor farmer took his credit card, took a loan to survive. And then they started to trouble him to pay. I mean, you know, when you <coughs> spend a little extra, the credit card guys keep chasing you. They hounded him so much, this farmer took his life. And we are seeing this now more. The more dependent an agriculture system is on a commercial market with few buyers. So for us, repairing that broken cycle is both re-establishing the cycle between the seed and the table, recognizing what the farmers give us, and give them a fair return. And it's possible. So we just did a study in about five crops. The crops being pushed in India right now are not foods. BT cotton and now hybrid corn. Most of the hybrid grow corn goes for animal feed, 75%. Globally, 10% of the corn and soya is eaten, the rest goes for biofuel and animal feed. It's not a food system at all. And that's that big discontinuity that I said, from food to non-food, from food to commodity. <laughs> And when we did this comparison of hybrid corn, hybrid rice, BT cotton, and compared it to local seeds, ecological agriculture, and fair trade systems, farmers are earning. And we didn't first project this. We just said, OK, what do they really earn? You, you make grow a good rajma. You can earn 10 times more than when you grow soya bean, which you can't eat at home. It has to go to factories. Large part goes for animal feed. Some of it goes into those horrible, terribly tasting um, nutrient nuggets, which and I don't know how we can uh, we could allow our dals to disappear and sub replace it because then you know there's a person who carries out the biggest feeding program, the Akshay Patra, the guy who does most of the donation. He said, "Well, then I'm soya bearing I said, you know, part of it, it's a phytoestrogen. And it's known as the 10th biggest reason for mortality in India. Sterility. Yeah. And it's known as the 10th biggest reason for male sterility. 
but forget that. I mean, compared to the dals, and I hundreds of dals, and when I started to do seed saving, I'd always get, of course, the local name. I, what little I knew, I would put the name, and then I'd go to the scientific name, or the English name. And it hit me. Just think of the dal. Yeah? If it's Chana, it's called chickpea. If it's Gehet, it's called horse gram. If it's Thun, it's called pigeon pea. Because the Malaysians didn't know what to do with it. So they used to feed it to the pigeons and the horses and the cows and you know, one is cow pea, other is called cow pea. So they missed out on some of the best food. Turn it into animal feed. And now we've got this whole culture where we're taking food and turning it into animal feed. Most of the soya is going to torture animals. We also realized in the process that the more we maintain a continuity with the cycles of nature, whether it be the hydrological cycle and water conservation, or it be the nutrient cycle and replenishing the health of the soil, on which depends our health, because Soils depleted of micronutrients and trace elements will give you food depleted of micronutrients and trace elements. And the British Journal of Nutrition had just put out a new report. Um, they surveyed a lot of published literature and found 60% more micronutrients and trace elements in organic food. Because the soil is getting that. And, and that's the beauty. The health of the soil and our health is one unbroken continuity. And we need to repair that. We do our best, and I, sometimes we, um, you know, the, what I really enjoyed in building Navdanya is we combine science and rigorous research with the best of cultural celebration, with um, putting farmers first and letting them teach us, um, removing the huge layers of inferiority that they have been burdened with, both in terms of their knowledge as well in terms of their status. I think the biggest vocation today is to grow food and work with the soil. That's why we've also started a Gardens of Hope program for schools. If you realize, it's only in the English language that the soil has been degraded into the negative. So if my clothes get dirty, they're soiled. Soil is dirt. It's dirty. In every other language, there's no there's a continuity between earth and soil. There's no separate word for soil. Mati ma is both the earth and the mati. Terra is the soil as well as the earth. And the more we work with the laws of the earth, the more food we are producing. So now, because of the huge demand, we run a one-month course. This year's course is full, 1st of September to 30th of September, on the A to Z of economic and organic food system, where we literally work A to Z. The living seed, the living soil, living food, the connections between food and health, lots of celebration, lots of cooking classes, and the beauty is it's on the farm, Nathaniel Farm in Dharagun, where everything's growing right there and uh, is organic, and that diversity, more than a thousand varieties of crop seeds. And I would like to invite all of you to a very big celebration we do annually called the Bhumi Festival. This year it's dedicated to food. And it's always on 1st of October, it's right next door at India International Center. Put it into your diaries. And uh, <coughs> let's keep building the continuities. So I think 
uh, it's fascinating. Uh, and what are the challenges that are coming in? Challenges from science and technology being used in a certain way, uh, promoted by certain institutions that create dependencies. So I think there are these challenges, there are these, the issue is being laid out. Uh, one of the ways that we are trying to solve it or address it is through the promotion of uh, uh, ecological methodologies of uh, bringing things together. So, uh, without much ado, let's uh, introduce and let's start off with interactions. Uh, please uh, uh, raise your hands and identify yourself and make a comment or a query. If there are comments, we'll take two at a time. And if there are queries, maybe we can start off with one. about nutrition education. So I do workshops from time to time and I try to do my bit and educate but it's not done. And something from the government uh, at, at the national level is being done about it.
Just to say this, that uh, the reason I said I enjoy it is because I'm an ecologist, and there are not too many such people who talk about these issues. Uh, as I, uh, when I, in, in my earlier Aftar, uh, I had a mentor uh, called Dilip Mathai. Yeah. <laughs> and he used to say something uh, which always uh, remained with me. He used to say that uh, when you're talking about ecology, think of working with nature than against it. So, and that's something which the moment you said that the river is flowing this way, we want to take it that other way. And something that I've also seen that uh, in the, most of the uh, engineers write that water is otherwise going waste into the sea. And I am, as a marine scientist, I'm also thinking that water doesn't go waste. It has an ecological function. And that's uh, sort of, that sort of sustains life in the coastal area, out in the sea. So, I mean, this is our warped way of thinking, and which is something which has come up, I think, this whole unsustainable way of living uh, goes hand in hand with the population explosion, with the industrial explosion, and somehow the industrial format of agriculture has followed, and we have certain somehow fallen prey into this, into this maelstrom that is sort of engulfing us. And the least we can do is sort of be aware that this is where we are, <laughs> and then perhaps take it further. Yeah. Please. You know, I'm, I'm among those who doesn't believe that greed is an essential human nature. Um, I think there's an ecology of greed. That there are certain contexts in which greed becomes the norm. What you're describing is the aberration. Um, and it's a bit like cancer cells. You know, healthy cells get regulated. They don't increase their numbers in an unregulated way. It's when any system loses regulation that you become like a cancerous entity. And part of what's called, you know, WTO rules was basically about deregulating commerce, which means allowing greed to have no social regulation or state regulation. And sadly, when you hear these debates on TV, you know, there's still a lot of fundamentalists, the neoliberal fundamentalists, who really do believe that systems can exist without regulation. Not political, not economic, not living systems can exist without regulation. And part of what we are dealing with today is the fact that we have an epistemic discontent which to me is the most troubling. That epistemic discontinuity has to do with the fact that we become so fragmented in our approach to things that the consequences of any action that you cite in the Gita uh, is beyond the scope of knowledge. And therefore, there's constant disruption and an inability to take it into account. And worse, when some, someone points it out, the last time I was in this room was around the IB report, you remember? The intelligence report. Yeah? Um, there's this fear. There's this fear of taking things into account. Because externalization, which we use a lot in the environment, Externalization of consequences becomes the epistemic norm. And so there's a discontinuity between benefit and costs. Those who bear the ben get the benefits, it's a privatization of profits and socialization of the ecological burden, <coughs> the health burden, and everything else. Now, that is a new structure. I agree with you that a trader would have adulterated oil in the past. But now the norm is adulterated oil. So this refined oil is adulterated oil. Mixing up everything and then making it odorless, colorless, you don't know where it comes from um, and what it'll do to your body. And vegetable oils, in my view, are one of the most serious discontinuities in our food system. 
And we Indians love our oils. We used to cook in coconut oil, in sesame oil, in sarso. I did a sarso satyagra in the city because when the soya oil was dumped, the slum women rang me up and said, Mari bache khana ni khari. Because for them, soya is not food. So I said, let me see what happened, and I did this whole study. And then we did a satyagra, and I called Sahib Singh, who was chief minister, to receive the first bottle of the satyagra sarso. And you know, the law that made it illegal is still on paper. It was called a packaging order. Can you imagine? The law was called a packaging order that if you don't have two chemists in a lab, you can't make oil. Now, the ghani in the village will never have two chemists in a lab. You've got two, oh, two animals who go around in a country ghani. Yeah? They were all made in India. A million ghanis were closed in one year. But we did this thing, so we managed to keep Sarso Patel going, and uh, Mohammed Yunus was visiting our Delhi Heart Organic Cafe. And those who haven't been there, please do. He said, you've got Sarso Patel. I said, Satay Rai Kati Pani. In Bangladesh, Bengalis can't live without mustard oil. It's gone. Only cooking is oil. I would like um, to ask a question, which is actually um, I have a comment and a question. In fact, Nike also um, claimed personhood when it was being sold for using children to manufacture things. And they won the case saying that we have the right to free speech, which doesn't mean we have to tell the truth. Which was quite interesting. Uh, my question was, do you, so we've been talking about commercialization and privatization being one of the main factors for why food is very safe. Do you see food surviving capitalism? Do you see capitalism or neoliberalism having a heavy relationship with food, or do you think it has to go completely in order to survive? Well, you know, I made a decision long ago to not discuss anything in the abstract. Because it gets you nowhere. So, the particular <coughs> groups of people organized as particular corporations. For me, that's the reality. There are particular people who grow our food, there are particular people who eat. And I'd rather stick to that concreteness. I think it's a totally open-ended uh, question about whether the corporations will succeed in destroying the planet. I gave you the figure of 75% planetary destruction. And corporation, a large-scale industrial farming only supplies 30% of the food eaten by people. 70% according to the United Nations comes from small farms. So if you take that 30% and take to 45%, the corresponding destruction of the planet will be 100%, from 75% to 100%. Now you can't grow food on a dead planet. But of course, there's such a habit of the mind to try and find an opportunity in every crisis, hoping that it will work. Two, in the last two months, consensus bought up the biggest climate corporation, saying so more unstable the climate, the more we control the data. You sell the seed and the data. They bought up very big soil data company. They're hoping every farmer will put their mobile oil phone on the ears and say, sell up yellow guy. What's the state of my soil? The soil is there. The farmer's in the soil, with the soil. The farmer will ring up and say, <coughs> What's the state of my soil? So it's, it's this total rupture, total discontinuity. Um, and the concentration is huge. Just saw something, they've even invested in the Ebola vaccine now. Yeah? So it's a total control, it's a totalitarian system around food. And sadly because food, because food is essential to life, it's the one thing you know you can sell to the poorest of those people, which happened with seed. Who would have imagined seed would become such a huge market? A trillion dollars is what they were talking about at that meeting that I met. The US farmers are spending 10 billion in royalty payment. They're that much poor. And I could go out country after country. Um, but the fact that I don't give up in the face of this totalitarian system is three factors. First, of course, my love for life. It'd be crazy to not love life. No? Uh, the second is because having done so many uh, 
Having looked at so many systems, I have such deep respect for the knowledge of our farmers. And even the spread of organic farming to the world went from India through Albert Howard. I won't take too much time because we're running out of time. But Sir Albert Howard is called the father of modern organic farming. He learned it from India. He made the best and the peasant his professors, as he says, in a book called Agricultural Testament. Um, and the third is that every intervention by industry, whether it be pesticides, or it be GMOs, or it be junk food, every step is actually a war against the earth and our bodies. And the evidence is accumulating. So I find, what I find very, very promising is the fact that as connections get made between things that were treated as separate, no one connected agriculture to food. No one connected food to nutrition. No one connected nutrition to health. And now we've been forced because of the problems that are being created. And there'll still be an attempt to manipulate. I mean, <coughs> the nutritional crisis, they want a GMO banana now. And we have a campaign uh, available on Nathaniel's website. Or iron deficit, or a vitamin A deficiency, the golden rice. So there's always this, but it's always, as I say, a mastery in stupidity. 7,000% more iron we can produce through the biodiversity we have. Rather than try and increase the iron from 0.44, they simply double it and triple it. Okay, you'll get to two. Four, four increase. And even that research, the man who has the patents never did this research. Our BARC did this work. And we are playing on Australia to develop GMO bananas. <laughs> and there's so much available in our biodiversity and our food culture. So I really feel we are at the moment where first, humility and learning from, from two groups of people, our farmers and our grandmothers. That's the breakthrough. And the minute we reach that breakthrough, then it becomes very, very evident that there's so many options we are not even exploring. And food as virginity then becomes actually the innovation. I think that's where the word innovation that drives me nuts every time I see it, is to redefine innovation as innovation as continuity. Because it doesn't make sense to destroy that which supports your life, whether it be ecosystems or your health, and call it progress. Surely, I mean, who among you is a good cartoonist? You need to write a cartoon book on this. Because tables and uh, graphs you know, reach very few people. What, what you need is good little cartoon. Mm -hmm. I'm an It's work. Uh, well, there has been this movement of uh, providing agricultural land. And again, it's called the Parthai Tribal Scheme, as you like the word scheme wherein they're clearing forests and, uh, in order to provide agricultural land, like the, uh, the Pune landslide that had occurred a few days back. One of the reasons they attribute to this landslide was that forests were cleared to provide agricultural land. Now my question is, how uh, is, is it justified to destruct a forest, which is a very rich and diverse ecosystem in itself, to provide land to produce food? It doesn't make sense to... Well, very quickly, you know, I was on the drafting committee on the expert group that drafted the Forest Rights and Tribal Rights Recognition Act. And uh, the two things that I put in there, one was that all the intellectual rights of knowledge of tribals is a collective right. Second, that they don't believe in private property. They have communal territory. And it's not the case that tribals don't eat. Just that the forest and shifting cultivation is very often the way they provide food. I, and I've written many articles at that time of the debate on the forest dwellers, right? Where there was this debate of creating private pass, parcels, which is destroying the tribal culture, because they've never believed in individual property. Two, at a time where we know that biodiversity <laughs> is the source of food and nutrition, 
to give up the tribal expertise in producing food in harmony with the forest for an agriculture that's totally non-sustainable. So the two big issues that the, the ecology movement really needs to pick up is, one, don't destroy the communal ownerships, which are in PESA, they're defined into PESA. You know, Panchayati Raj extension to scheduled areas, which is 1996. And that defined it very clearly, in fact, it was the destruction of PESA that is at the root of the problem in Chhattisgarh of the next time problem. Because I've been there when they were making their decisions and then tribes were arrested, thrown into jail. And uh, by the end of the day, yeah, of course they felt if democracy doesn't work, let's use art. Second is the model of agriculture. That you can't take a non-sustainable model of agriculture and use it into forests where there will be chemical use, there will be this kind of use of JCBs. The Dale Square Farm, you work with it, JCB or that. Um, so I think those are very big issues, very big issues. And I'm absolutely convinced that this, uh, you know, uh, giving private holdings was basically a way of land grab. Because as long as it's communal, you can't take something away from a community. Which is why on seed also we say it belongs to the community. But the minute it is this person's, then that poor person will be sooner or later into it. You know. and, and nowadays, there are no non alienable rights anymore on the land issue. Uh, in 1991, the World Bank made sure that those non alienable rights, like for the Dalits and all that, that everything is a tradable right. So I, I think these are very big issues. The issue is not growing food. The issue is growing non-food. <coughs> At the cost of destroying forests. At the cost of destroying forests and life. How many people died? I would like to ask something which is not directly related to anything you have said right now, but in a larger context with your work, uh, which relates to the question of ecofeminism. Because I think the problem a lot of us have with ecofeminism is that it equates, it says women and environment is equal to zero and men is equal to one, which <laughs> at least that's the way we've read it. So what it actually says is that men exploit both women as well as the environment. So it essentially it says that women are in some way closer to the environment than men are. So somehow, mm, although I would like to understand ecofeminism, but when it's put like this, you know, it begins to sound like a little... No, I mean, what it means to say is that women are closer to the environment than men. So women and environment, and men are these people who are coming and oppressing both women as well as the environment. Is that what ecofeminism is actually trying to say? Well, whoever's teaching you has to be The point is about systems. It's not about men and women. It's about systems. And there's adequate archaeological evidence and adequate historical evidence that agriculture was really founded by women. And most societies still about 6,500 years ago were women-centered and nature-centered. And then rose patriarchy, which used violence to conquer both women and nature. And then the history of patriarchy carries on constantly mutating itself, constantly changing itself. And what's happening today, I call it a, a hybrid. A hybrid between capitalism and traditional patriarchies. And that's why I call it capitalist patriarchy. So you have to think in terms of structures and not men and women. And it is very, very true that the structures that govern us today, whether it be structures of how we think and the mind, how we define the economy, what we define as agriculture, is about conquest, and it is about erasing the contributions of nature. And to me, two uh, aspects of my study of, uh, and the experience in Punjab stand out. I started to see billboards during my study in 1984 on sex selection. And before that, just as in every other part of India, men and women worked together in the And they were chemicals and the tractors, and the women were removed. Now women were a redundant sex. And before you know it, 
female fetus science started, and according to Omar Kassan, 13 million girls haven't been allowed to be born in this country. The second thing, I remember very clearly, here was a woman collecting grass at one end of the same field, and at the other end, her husband was spraying Roundup to kill the grass. <laughs> because the extension officers had got to him and said he was Roundup. Yeah. So, structures, of course, then infiltrate. Yeah. But when you are in a patriarchy, women too participate in that patriarchal structure. <coughs> and when you are in a system where you consciously recognize the contributions of nature and women, that's all like ecofeminism says, recognize the contributions, <coughs> recognize the subject of them, recognize the autonomy. From that then flows a whole different system. But tell your teacher, she is being reductionist. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just uh, add a little bit on this. It's the fact that, uh, as we were mentioning, it's about life. And it's women who give birth. And from that perspective, the Mother Earth is seen as a giver of life. And that's where the Gia concept uh, comes up. So it's, there is a very close connection between life and women. And women from a very uh, abstract, theoretical perspective, but if you break it down, of course, it, it opens up a whole new vista. Yeah. Uh, maybe the last question now, because uh, then, uh, okay, there are quite a few. Is that, so let's have two at, at a time. Uh, um, uh, two things. One is, Madhav, if you would just please once more explain uh, this roundup. Uh, what you mean by roundup, and uh, then the second thing is that, uh, see, uh, you've spoken about food continuity, and he's spoken about the greed, and she's spoken about deforestation, and all of this I follow urban plan uh, very closely, and we can see the disaster. Uh, when I heard uh, a politician saying that, oh, these people, these handful, are worried about some piece of paper which is called a master plan, and then it's really uh, how can you use something like this and these regulatory policies etc so it's just years and years just following these things um how do you think do you think that uh, uh, in india or uh, globally things turning around will we ever get back to um, uh, doing things the way nature uh, determines that they should be done or are we going to stop when we've destroyed the earth and ourselves? Now, how do you see it? Because, uh, as you said, uh, um, Mr. But, um, gentlemen, uh, no, I'm just not able to. Yes. So, uh, as he said that he enjoyed it, uh, like this gentleman here, I'm very frightened. I mean, we're seeing this all the time, the greed phenomenon, and, and basically that's the root cause. So where do you think, I mean, people like you, who are working towards it, how much are your numbers and are we going to really be able to turn things around before we've completely done ourselves out of it? Because it just doesn't seem to be stopping, you know. I mean, and unless it's a global turnaround, I don't see ourselves turning around because, as you say, we are so addicted to discontinuity. So, so how? Yeah. So. I want to, to add. Uh, continue with the Ram's point. I am actually an urban planner. So we are deeply involved in master planning. Uh, Ma'am, over a period of time, we have come to realize that cities are going to be our inevitable future. And as more and more people migrate to cities, a large population of rural poverty is uh, going to travel into our urban systems. And there are already examples that we see around of ruralization or uh, you know, rural pockets within cities. And one example in Delhi, which we have noticed, is the Yamuna banks, where a lot of farming is uh, going on. So how do we convince our, or is it possible to convince our policy makers who have just allocated in the, in the rural budget almost 5,000 crores for cold storages and warehouses, that we can recognize urban farming as a sustainable and viable way forward instead of looking at it as, a, as, as this invisible you know, piece of land which doesn't, it is, um, it is white on a master plan right now. These pockets are not recognized. So, uh, I don't know if it's a question, but it's basically my frustration, you know, like, uh, I've lost my love for food, you know, like, all the burgers in McD, KFC, go to any city, they taste the same. 
and and I mean all the fruits look the same, you know, like red color apples, yellow color bananas, and I love kumba, and kumba doesn't taste the same as it used to like seven years back, and we are blaming corporations, politicians, but we are not blaming ourselves. I mean, we have all the information lying around, like we have books, but food is not a priority. I mean, maybe for you, maybe for me, but people don't give a damn what how food tastes. They just accept it, and there is. I mean. We need this hope, you know, like those who value or like food is no more a priority, you know. So this it's was just a frustration remark, which is the fight. <laughs> Let me go to the last one, absolute last one. Yeah, yeah, is, there is one more. I just had two things to say. The first, um, I kind of had a problem with what you said about feminism being related to the mother earth because we also give birth and we also give birth. I think that's very problematic because I think it just reinforces the traditional gender roles of motherhood and what you're supposed to do as a mother and care and nurture. I'm sorry. But other than that, the other thing I wanted to ask about is when um, um, when you spoke, when, when when you spoke about um, uh, depression, how how there's more depression in in, in Australia among um, the teenagers, I I actually wanted to ask something related to that. Like, how does food affect us in that way? Because I've been noticing a, a, a lot for me. This is a personal experience. A lot of the, Girls my age are teenage women having um, having uh, PCOS, that is polycystic ovarian syndrome. So a lot of a lot of us are suffering from hormonal disorders, and we we don't know what to turn to for medication. It's it's troubles because you go to the doctor, then they give you more hormones, and it's a vicious cycle. Is is our food really affecting our hormones in a way that we're susceptible to depression, diabetes, and we it affects us for Is this a food issue? Take this question as well. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, very basically, I'd uh, like to ask you do you think that food security at a certain level, insecurity actually, food insecurity for that fact, at a certain level is a kind of a construct that has been created by? Third, a third party kind of thing, like a vested somebody with another kind of interest, say an international organization or larger world bodies. And also, uh, very practically, how difficult and or feasible is it to forward an organic model when or if you agree that there is an exponential growth in population that is looking for very quick fix solutions? question about when will we wake up. Uh, you know, thank goodness, uncertainty is the nature of reality. Uh, because it's not predetermined that uh, total devastation has to take place. In any case, total devastation and waking up after that devastation doesn't work. Because once you're extinct, you don't wake up. Um, and what I really take hope from is the numbers of people who are waking up for different reasons. Uh, people who have just grown up in democracy can't stand this idea of a food dictatorship. And they're experiencing it. Yeah? People like me might write a few books, but it's the day you can't know what's in your food that's when you start to mobilize. And meantime, you've got a sick kid. Because in, in the US, they've got this new problem of animals having perpetual diarrhea and kids having perpetual diarrhea. And kids have this leaky gut syndrome, where they have holes in the gut. And there was a study done in 98 by Akbar Putsai on GM crops, where his study showed, and then, not trying to put all the pressure, he did a study for the government of UK. And his lab was shut down because 
the consequences were so much. Arnab, Mr. Putsan, Dr. Putsan. And he went back to Hungary. He, he had come from Hungary, he went back to Hungary. He said, I have more freedom in an ex-communist ex country. Um, a, a lot of young people are here for two reasons. You know, the kind of questions that have come from many of them. But if you look at the United States, every college graduate has a $20,000 debt and no job. And they're looking for other ways. Southern Europe, and I work with Greece, I work with Rome, I work with Spain, I work with Portugal. 50% of the youth in this formal system, no one. So you can redefine work. And in my view, the work will be in relationship with the potential of the earth. You know? Which is what we <coughs> shut our minds to. We're not looking adequately to and even in India, you know, the two big promises made in the last election were we bring down prices and we create employment. But you can't create employment through systems that destroy employment. So that's a huge issue. And I think we are at such a deep crisis that creative uh, rethinking and creative redoing, uh, it's, it's a bit like a very small lamp in a very dark room. It throws light. And that's the best contribution we can make. On the issue of urban food, I absolutely agree. But it's not, you know, the farmers of uh, Yamuna uh, bed are not recent, it's ancient. And river beds have always been the most fertile soil because every year the silt comes down and you have to apply nothing. In fact, I did a big satyagra on the Asian Games village which was built in the flood plain, totally illegally. And it's lying there as a haunted house now because nobody wants it. Um, so it's definitely those spaces, but I think every rooftop, uh, every balcony, every, that's why we do these gardens of hope with, with children. And there were two schools which had no land, but they put pots on their terrace. And I think that's a place where a lot of urban design can come in, in fascinating ways. What, you know, what would be the containers? How would you lay it out? It's, just amazing. It's limitless, the potential. You have to go through so many series. You know, who stops you from putting a pot on your terrace? Okay. Also, vertical bed, permaculture. You don't need permission. Permaculture, vertical bed. Waterproof. Yeah, no, you can get bigger. Soilless. In any case. And also, you know, I think there are always ways. I believe that you to find out what needs to be done and do it. And then if a bureaucracy comes in the way, then you practice a little bit of something. I'll <laughs> just to add one thing here. This is what we saw in Bihar, uh, where most of the farmers are landless, actually. So <coughs> land is owned by a few, and the people who work on it do not own a piece of land. But interestingly, they are settled on a piece of land, so they have a homestead, which is all the land they have. Uh, so he said, what do we do about food security here? And uh, one of our uh, program staff, what he did was he came up with an innovative solution. He reverse engineered the agriculture, urban agriculture concept, where you have these terrace yeah. kind of agriculture. He just used a gunny bag and filled it up with some soil and compost, <laughs> punched holes, and put some seeds. And then there were creepers, which came out and went on top. And then what it produced was just a few vegetables. Vegetables just enough to feed the family. And sometimes if you have two or three more gunny bags, you can have a small bucket which you can go out and sell. Now the interesting thing of this was that you did not have to teach too many people. They sort of saw each other and started picking it up quickly. And more interestingly, we came up with a four-page flyer and went to the government of Bihar. The chief secretary looked at it, picked up the phone, and said, hey, you have this amount of money lying with you. Why don't you create it into a scheme and <laughs> lost it? 500,000 families to actually do this. And that's how it spread. So it works. 
And for you who were worried about food not tasting good at all, um, that's why we created Nathania. Our kiras are delicious. <laughs> I will go at, at the farm when we have a lot of interns, the interns will just live on kira, right out of the field. Because we grow maki, kira, and uh, beets, which in the Native American tradition is called the three sisters, but in India it's been a tradition to always the three. So, and then if you want to grow your own in that very bag, <coughs> take some seeds. <coughs> because we, we have good organic open pollinated vegetable seeds. Um, and I started that after the vegan. You know, when they wanted to bring BT vegan, because before that we were only looking at <coughs> it. Now we do it. Uh, the young person in the back. You know, I think feminism has had a discontinuity because not everyone needs to be a mother. Not every woman needs to be a mother, not if a man won't be a mother, but all of us have had mothers. And it's that disrespect of the mother that is at the root of so much that has gone wrong. So, and I know because, you know, 40 years I've been at this. And uh, there is this sort of knee-jerk reaction, motherhood. But you wouldn't be here without your mother. So it's her respect, it's not what people are imposing on you. No one is imposing motherhood on you, but you are a gift from your mother just as much as all life is a gift for Mother Earth. We have a very good movement now. Started after the collapse of the Copenhagen Treaty, uh, you know, in uh, Copenhagen. And Eva Morales, the Native American, said, we were here to defend the rights of Mother Earth. And it's become an agreement of the rights of polluters to continue to pollute. And he said, I'm going to go back and organize it. And he created a group of us to write a universal declaration on the rights of Mother Earth that is like the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. And I don't think we're going to survive if we don't recognize the Earth as a living system who, like a mother, gives us everything we need, from the soil to the water to the food. Uh, and I, I, I think this whole issue of the word mother doesn't mean it's being imposed on you. The word mother merely means it's, the, it's how life reproduces. Yeah? Um, you also talked about uh, new problems young women are having. Um, and I think this whole alienation with food is an alienation with our bodies too. And there's so much now, so much. You know, this course I mentioned in the last week, we're going to have uh, two psychiatrists coming from Italy who are finding out so much of the psychiatric issue is related. And they're treating people now through food. Um, because food does affect the mind. And I mentioned autism, I mentioned you know, Alzheimer's, anything that affects the brain, they're now realizing it. Food not just as the nutrition in it, but food loaded with the chemicals that it's coming with. You wanted to know, I didn't answer your question on Roundup. Glyphosate is a chemical that kills weeds. Monsanto patented a version with glyphosate and other chemicals, which they called Roundup as their trade name. Roundup meaning it kills, it kills everything green. That, that's how they defined it. Now, what's being found, and, and then they developed these Roundup ready crops where you genetically engineer a crop with a gene of resistance to Roundup so you can straight spray more Roundup and everything else dies except the plant that you make, except that their super weeds emerge, and that's why the technology is failing. Um, there's new research that's coming out, and I'm not going to take too much time explaining it, but new research is coming out that glyphosate around it killates, it, it binds metals. So what it's doing is removing nutrition in the soil, it's removing nutrition in the world. And part of what we are finding is, just like the soil has these millions and billions of microorganisms, our gut has millions of microorganisms. Now, every one of those organisms is performing a function. And as long as our gut is healthy, and it gets unhealthy when too much pesticide you eat and antibiotics, all of this, just as nutrition in the soil is created by the balance of 
the soil organisms. Our bodily health and our mental health is created by healthy gut bacteria and microorganisms. Now, they are releasing the tiny doses of chemical that keeps your brain functions going. Different things. And as they go, the brain functions go. And that's getting a lot of new research is coming out of that. And of course, Monsanto hounds every. You see, I anyway started my work on Navdanya to take on Monsanto. That was, you know, it's going to destroy the biodiversity of this planet. But so many scientists are just doing the work innocently. But if it has an implication on GMOs, they hung them out. Yeah? It's fascinating. Now, even scientists were showing these connections between the brain and the gut are being chased. Let's not talk too much about that. I believe the word food insecurity is a construct for colonization. Because we had food culture. We had nourishment. We had other words. And politically now, the movement that I'm part of, we talk about Andhraswaraj, and globally we talk of food sovereignty. Because when 1991, our structural adjustment took place, the World Bank clearly said, food security is dollars in your pocket, not food in the go-down. And Narasimha Rao made a speech in Karnataka. And the women said, Neither do we have pockets, we wear sarees. No, it's dollars, we deal in rupees. But it was a slogan that was repeated again and again and again, food security. Now, even this current fight in WTO is the US is saying, you can't buy grain from your farms. You've got a food security law, more than a trillion rupees subsidy. All of this grain will be bought in the international market from our corporations. Now, they are speculating on food. From 2008 onwards, food is a commodity. Well, global speculation. And at every level where an investor invests, it's 25% return. And there'll be at least three to four investors, which means 75% to 100% increase in price. And if you don't control that, there's no way you can deal with inflation. Yeah? So, a trillion rupees. Market is a very big market. But what will they sell? GM corn and GM soya? Because well, that's all they have. That's why the reawakening of the memory of our biodiversity, which, as I say, is the richest anywhere in the world. No one eats as much diversity as we do. One thali is more than 20 pounds every day. Every day, more than 20 pounds. And then our Ayurvedic teaching is, you must have the five tastes. And the minute you have the five tastes, you'll have a balanced diet. You don't have to go around measuring 2% nutrients, 2 percent that, nutrition facts. I love nutrition facts, where on more bottles of water, they say zero fat. <laughs> you know? But there should be some relevance to what information you're giving. So, you know, I, I think it's, we are in a very interesting moment of, as I said, stupidity and total control. Now that's dangerous, huh? Total control in the hands of stupidity. Or the intelligence of nature, and I'll come back to the issue of motherhood. The thing is we've had a civilizational confusion. And it's been constructed through all the paradigms that rule our minds and our systems. Creativity in nature, which includes the seed reproducing, creativity in humanity, which includes both the biological reproduction as well as the social reproduction. <coughs> because you can't bring out a baby without huge amounts of social knowledge. Try it. Very tough. The baby will die. You know, a calf is born, it runs the moment it comes out. Nine months our baby stay in us, and then two years, ten years, sometimes thirty-five years. <laughs> That's the social reproduction. That's what I was mentioning as social <coughs> Um That was defined as non-creative, passivity. So the whole scientific revolution was based on saying nature is dead. Nature is not alive. That's what Bacon, Newton, all of them were very hard to say nature is dead. <coughs> and women are passive. They don't reduce. Women don't work. They work like mad, but they don't work. And what was defined as creative action was destructive action. That's what got valued in GDP. 
That's what got value in innovation. I mean, GDP's definition is you cut a forest, you have growth. You plant a tree, there's no growth. Child falls sick, you got growth. Healthy kids don't create growth. Healthy societies don't create growth. Happy societies don't create growth, which is why Bhutan said we won't measure the GDP, we measure gross national happiness. And that, I feel, is the way things will move. It's not that old structures give up without resistance. Structure of scientific revolution, Thomas Kuhn, a lot of resistance. Even when the system's failing, it's not delivering. But the difference between other aspects and food is food is life. You keep falling ill beyond a point, you set it right, and your body will tell you, yeah, now I'm healthier. Then you continue on that path. Okay, I think we have run way beyond time. Uh, but it was uh, definitely a great awakening, I must say, uh, for many of us here. And I think you have brought about a, a whole range of issues, uh, something that uh, is remarkable. So thank you, and look forward to hearing more of you.